Third Girl by Agatha Christie Read by Hugh Fraser Hercule Poirot was sitting at the breakfast table. At his right hand was a steaming cup of chocolate. He had always had a sweet tooth. To accompany the chocolate was a brioche. It went agreeably with chocolate. He nodded his approval. This was from the fourth shop he had tried. It was a Danish patisserie, but infinitely superior to the so-called French one nearby. That had been nothing less than a fraud. He was satisfied gastronomically. His stomach was at peace. His mind also was at peace, perhaps somewhat too much so. He had finished his magnum opus, an analysis of great writers of detective fiction. He had dared to speak scathingly of Edgar Allan Poe. He had complained of the lack of method or order in the romantic outpourings of Wilkie Collins, had lauded to the skies two American authors who were practically unknown and had in various other ways given honour where honour was due, and sternly withheld it where he considered it was not. He had seen the volume through the press, had looked upon the results, and, apart from a really incredible number of printer's errors, pronounced that it was good. He had enjoyed this literary achievement, and enjoyed the vast amount of reading he had had to do, had enjoyed snorting with disgust as he flung a book across the floor, though always remembering to rise, pick it up, and dispose of it tidily in the waste-paper basket, and had enjoyed appreciatively nodding his head on the rare occasions when such approval was justified. And now? He had had a pleasant interlude of relaxation, very necessary after his intellectual labour, but one could not relax forever. One had to go on to the next thing. Unfortunately, he had no idea what the next thing might be. Some further literary accomplishment? He thought not. Do a thing well, then leave it alone. That was his maxim. The truth of the matter was, he was bored. All this strenuous mental activity in which he had been indulging, there had been too much of it. It had got him into bad habits. It had made him restless, vexatious. He shook his head and took another sip of chocolate. The door opened, and his well-trained servant George entered. His manner was deferential and slightly apologetic. He coughed and murmured, A, he paused, a, a young lady has called. Poirot looked at him with surprise and mild distaste. I do not see people at this hour, he said reprovingly. No, sir, agreed George. Master and servant looked at each other. Communication was sometimes fraught with difficulties for them. By inflection or innuendo, or a certain choice of words, George would signify that there was something that might be elicited if the right question was asked. Poirot considered what the right question in this case might be. "'She is uh, good-looking, this young lady?' he inquired carefully. "'In my view, no, sir. But there is no accounting for tastes.' Poirot considered his reply. He remembered the slight pause that George had made before the phrase, young lady. George was a delicate social recorder. He'd been uncertain of the visitor's status, but had given her the benefit of the doubt. You are of the opinion that she is a young lady, rather than, uh, let us say, a young person? I think so, sir, though uh, it is not always easy to tell nowadays. George spoke with genuine regret. Did she give a reason for wishing to see me? As she said, George pronounced the words with some reluctance, apologizing for them in advance, as it were, that she wanted to consult you about a murder that she might have committed. Hercule Poirot stared. His eyebrows rose. Might have committed? Does she not know? That is what she said, sir. Unsatisfactory, but possibly interesting, said Poirot. It might... Uh, have been a joke, sir, said George dubiously. Anything is possible, I suppose, conceded Poirot. But one would hardly think... He lifted his cup. Show her in, after five minutes. Yes, sir. George withdrew. Poirot finished the last sip of chocolate. He pushed aside his cup and rose to his feet. He walked to the fireplace and adjusted his moustaches carefully in the mirror over the chimney-piece. Satisfied, he returned to his chair and awaited the arrival of his visitor. 
he did not know exactly what to expect. He had hoped, perhaps, for something nearer to his own estimate of female attraction. The outworn phrase, beauty in distress, had occurred to him. He was disappointed when George returned, ushering in the visitor. Inwardly, he shook his head and sighed. Here was no beauty, and no noticeable distress either. Mild perplexity would seem nearer the mark. <laughs> thought Poirot disgustedly. These girls, do they not even try to make something of themselves? Well made up, attractively dressed, hair that has been arranged by a good hairdresser, then perhaps she might pass, but now... His visitor was a girl of perhaps twenty-odd, long, straggly hair of indeterminate colour strayed over her shoulders. Her eyes, which were large, bore a vacant expression, and were of a greenish blue. She wore what were presumably the chosen clothes of her generation, black high-leather boots, white open-work woollen stockings of doubtful cleanliness, a skimpy skirt, and a long and sloppy pullover of heavy wool. Any one of Poirot's age and generation would have had only one desire, to drop the girl into a bath as soon as possible. He had often felt this same reaction walking along the streets. There were hundreds of girls looking exactly the same. They all looked dirty. And yet, a contradiction in terms, this one had the look of having been recently drowned and pulled out of a river. Such girls, he reflected, were not perhaps really dirty. They merely took enormous care and pains to look so. He rose with his usual politeness, shook hands, and drew out a chair. You demanded to see me, mademoiselle. Sit down, I pray of you. Oh, said the girl in a slightly breathless voice. She stared at him. Eh bien, said Poirot. She hesitated. I, I think I I'd rather stand. The large eyes continued to stare doubtfully. "'As you please.' Poirot resumed his seat and looked at her. He waited. The girl shuffled her feet. She looked down on them, and then up again at Poirot. "'You... you are Hercule Poirot?' "'Assuredly.' "'In what way can I be of use to you?' "'Oh, well, it's rather difficult. I mean...' Poirot felt that she might need perhaps a little assistance." He said helpfully, "'My manservant told me that you wanted to consult me because you thought you might have committed a murder. Is that correct?' The girl nodded. "'That's right. Surely that is not a matter that admits of any doubt. You must know yourself whether you have committed a murder or not.' "'Well, I, I don't quite know how to put it. I mean, come now.' said Poirot kindly. Sit down. Relax the muscles. Tell me all about it. I don't think... Oh, dear. I don't know how to... You see, it's all so difficult. I... I I've changed my mind. I... I don't want to be rude, but... Well, I think I'd better go. Come now. Courage. No, I can't. I thought I could come and... And ask you, uh, ask you what I ought to do, but I, I can't. You see, it's all so different from, from what? I'm awfully sorry, and I really don't want to be rude. But she breathed an enormous sigh, looked at Poirot, looked away, and suddenly blurted out, "You're too old. Nobody told me you were so old. I really don't want to be rude, but there it is. You're too old." I'm really very sorry. She turned abruptly and blundered out of the room, rather like a desperate moth in lamplight. Poirot, his mouth open, heard the bang of the front door. He ejaculated, Nom de nom de nom. The telephone rang. Hercule Poirot did not even seem aware of the fact. It rang with shrill and insistent persistence. George entered the room and stepped towards it turning a questioning glance towards Poirot. Poirot gestured with his hand. "'Leave it,' he said. George obeyed, leaving the room again. The telephone continued to ring. The shrill, irritating noise continued. Suddenly it stopped. After a minute or two, however, it commenced to ring again. "'Ah, sapristi! That must be a woman. Undoubtedly a woman!' He sighed, rose to his feet, and came to the instrument. 
He picked up the receiver. Hello, he said. Are you... Is that Monsieur Poirot? I myself. It's Mrs. Oliver. Your voice sounds different. I didn't recognize it at first. Bonjour, madame. You are well, I hope? Oh, I'm all right. Ariadne Oliver's voice came through in its usual cheerful accents. The well-known detective story writer and Hercule Poirot were on friendly terms. It's rather early to ring you up, but I want to ask you a favor. Yes? It is the annual dinner of our Detective Authors Club. I wondered if you would come and be our guest speaker this year. It would be very, very sweet of you, if you would. When is this? Next month, the 23rd. A deep sigh came over the telephone. Alas, I am too old. Too old? What on earth do you mean? You're not old at all. You think not? Well, of course not. You'll be wonderful. You can tell us lots of lovely stories about real crimes. And who will want to listen? Well, everyone. They... Monsieur Poirot, is there anything the matter? Has something happened? You sound upset. Yes, I am upset. My feelings... Ah, well, no matter. But tell me about it. Why should I make a fuss? Why shouldn't you? You'd better come and tell me all about it. When will you come? This afternoon? Come and have tea with me. Afternoon tea, I do not drink it. Well, then you can have coffee. It is not the time of day I usually drink coffee. A chocolate? With whipped cream on top? Or a tisane? You love sipping tisanes. Or lemonade or orangeade? Or would you like decaffeinated coffee if I can get it? Ah, ça non. Par exemple, it is an abomination. One of those syrups you like so much. Oh, I know. I've got half a bottle of Ribena in the cupboard. What is Ribena? Black currant flavor. Indeed, one has to hand it to you. You really do try, madame. I am touched by your solicitude. I will accept with pleasure to drink a cup of chocolate this afternoon. Good. And then you'll tell me all about what's upset you. She rang off. Poirot considered for a moment. Then he dialed a number. Presently he said, Mr. Gobi? Hercule Poirot here. Are you very fully occupied at this moment? Middling, said the voice of Mr. Gobi. Uh, middling to fair, but to oblige you, Monsieur Poirot, uh, if you're in a hurry, as you usually are, well, I wouldn't say that my young men couldn't manage mostly what's on hand at present. Of course, uh, good boys aren't as easy to get as they used to be. Think too much of themselves nowadays. Think they know it all before they've started to learn. But there, can't expect old heads on young shoulders. I'll be pleased to put myself at your disposal, Monsieur Poirot. Maybe I can put one or two of the better lads on the job. I suppose it's the usual, uh, collecting information. He nodded his head and listened whilst Poirot went into details of exactly what he wanted done. When he had finished with Mr. Gobi, Poirot rang up Scotland Yard, where in due course he got through to a friend of his. When he in turn had listened to Poirot's requirements, he replied, "'Don't want much, do you? Any murder? Anywhere? Time, place, and victim unknown? <laughs> Sounds a bit of a wild goose chase, if you ask me, old boy,' he added disapprovingly. "'You don't really seem to know anything.' At 4.15 that afternoon, Poirot sat in Mrs. Oliver's drawing-room, sipping appreciatively at a large cup of chocolate topped with foaming whipped cream, which his hostess had just placed on a small table beside him. She added a small plate full of longue de chat biscuits. Chère madame, <laughs> what kindness! He looked over his cup with faint surprise at Mrs. Oliver's coiffure, and also at her new wallpaper. Both were new to him. The last time he had seen Mrs. Oliver, her hairstyle had been plain and severe. It now displayed a richness of coils and twists arranged in intricate patterns all over her head. Its prolific luxury was, he suspected, largely artificial. He debated in his mind how many switches of hair might unexpectedly fall off if Mrs. Oliver was to get suddenly excited, as was her wont. As for the wallpaper, those uh, cherries, uh, they are new? He waved a teaspoon. It was, he felt, rather like being in a cherry orchard. "'Are there too many of them, do you think?' asked Mrs. Oliver. "'So hard to tell beforehand with wallpaper. Do you think my old one was better?' Poirot cast his mind back dimly to what he seemed to remember as large quantities of bright-coloured tropical birds in a forest. 
he felt inclined to remark, Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, but restrained himself. And now, said Mrs. Oliver, as her guest finally replaced his cup on its saucer and sat back with a sigh of satisfaction, wiping remnants of foaming cream from his moustache, what is all this about? That uh, I can tell you very simply. This morning a girl came to see me. I suggested she might make an appointment. One has one's routine, you comprehend. She sent back word that she wanted to see me at once, because she thought she might have committed a murder. What an odd thing to say! Didn't she know? Precisely. C'est inouï. So, I instructed George to show her in. She stood there. She refused to sit down. She just stood there staring at me. She seemed quite half-witted. I tried to encourage her. Then suddenly she said that she'd changed her mind. She said that she didn't want to be rude, but that—what do you think?—but that I was too old. Mrs. Oliver hastened to utter soothing words. Oh, well, girls are like that. Anyone over thirty-five they think is half dead. They've no sense, girls. You must realize that. It wounded me, said Hercule Poirot. Well, I shouldn't worry about it if I were you. Of course, it was a very rude thing to say. Oh, that does not matter. And it is not only my feelings. I am worried. Yes, uh, I am worried. Well, I should forget all about it if I were you, advised Mrs. Oliver comfortably. Y you do not understand. I am worried about this girl. She came to me for help. Then she decided that I was too old, too old to be of any use to her. She was wrong, of course, that goes without saying. And then she just ran away. But I tell you, that girl needs help. I don't suppose she does, really, said Mrs. Oliver, soothingly. Girls make a fuss about things. No, you are wrong. She needs help. Well, you don't think she really has committed a murder? Why not? She said she had. Well, yes, but... Mrs. Oliver stopped. She said she might have. She said slowly... But what can she possibly mean by that? Exactly. It does not make sense. Who did she murder, or did she think she'd murdered? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. And why did she murder someone? Again Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Of course, it could be all sorts of things, Mrs. Oliver began to brighten, as she set her ever-prolific imagination to work. She could have run over someone in her car and not stopped— she could have been assaulted by a man on a cliff and struggled with him and managed to push him over. She could have given someone the wrong medicine by mistake. She could have gone to one of those purple pill parties and had a fight with someone. She could have come to and found she had stabbed someone. She assez, madame, assez. But Mrs. Oliver was well away. She might have been a nurse in the operating theatre and administered the wrong anaesthetic, or— She broke off, suddenly anxious for clearer details. What did she look like? Poirot considered for a moment. "'Anophilia, devoid of physical attraction.' "'Oh, dear,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'I can almost see her when you say that. "'How queer!' "'She is not competent,' said Poirot. "'That is how I see her. "'She is not one who can cope with difficulties. "'She is not one of those who can see beforehand the dangers that must come. "'She is one of whom others will look round and say, "'We want a victim. "'That one will do.' "'But Mrs. Oliver was no longer listening.' She was clutching her rich coils of hair with both hands in a gesture with which Poirot was familiar. Wait! she cried, in a kind of agony. Wait! Poirot waited, his eyebrows raised. You didn't tell me her name, said Mrs. Oliver. She did not give it. Unfortunate, I agree with you. Wait! implored Mrs. Oliver again with the same agony. She relaxed her grip on her head and uttered a deep sigh. Hair detached itself from its bonds and tumbled over her shoulders. A super-imperial coil of hair detached itself completely and fell on the floor. Poirot picked it up and put it discreetly on the table. "'Now, then,' said Mrs. Oliver, suddenly restored to calm. She pushed in a hairpin or two and nodded her head while she thought. "'Who told this girl about you, Monsieur Poirot?' Well, "'No one, as far as I know. Naturally, she had heard about me, no doubt.' Mrs. Oliver thought that naturally was not the word at all. What was natural was that Poirot himself was sure that everyone had always heard of him. Actually, large numbers of people would only look at you blankly if the name of Hercule Poirot was mentioned, especially the younger generation. 
But how am I going to put that to him? thought Mrs. Oliver, in such a way that it won't hurt his feelings. I think you're wrong, she said. Girls, well, girls and young men, they don't know very much about detectives and things like that. They don't hear about them. Everyone must have heard about Hercule Poirot, said Poirot superbly. It was an article of belief for Hercule Poirot. But they're all so badly educated nowadays, said Mrs. Oliver. Really, the only people whose names they know are pop singers or groups or disc jockeys, that sort of thing. If you need someone special, I mean a doctor or a detective or a dentist, well then, I mean you would ask someone. Ask who's the right person to go to. And then the other person says, My dear, you must go to that absolutely wonderful man in Queen Anne Street. Twist your legs three times round your head and you're cured. Or, all my diamonds were stolen, and Henry would have been furious, so I couldn't go to the police, but there's a simply uncanny detective, most discreet, and he got them back for me, and Henry never knew a thing. And that's the way it happens all the time. Someone sent that girl to you. I doubt it very much. Oh, he wouldn't know until you were told. And you're going to be told now. It's only just come to me. I sent that girl to you. Poirot stared. You? But why did you not say so at once? "'Because it's only just come to me. "'When you spoke about Ophelia, long, wet-looking hair and rather plain, "'it seemed a description of someone I'd actually seen, quite lately. "'And then it came to me who it was. "'Who was she? "'I don't actually know her name, but I can easily find out. "'We were talking about uh, private detectives and private eyes, "'and I spoke about you and some of the amazing things you had done. "'And you gave her my address? Well, "'No, of course I didn't. "'I had no idea she wanted a detective or anything like that.' I thought we were just talking, but I'd mentioned the name several times, and of course it would be easy to look you up in the telephone book and just come along. Were you talking about murder? Well, not that I can remember. I don't even know how we came to be talking about detectives, unless... Yes, perhaps it was she who started the subject. Tell me, then. Tell me all you can, even if you do not know her name. Tell me all you know about her. Well, it was last weekend. I was staying with the Lorimers. They don't come into it, except that they took me over to some friends of theirs for drinks. There were several people there, and I didn't enjoy myself much, because, as you know, I don't really like drink. And so people have to find a soft drink for me, which is rather a bore for them. And then people say things to me, you know, how much they like my books, and how they've been longing to meet me, and it all makes me feel hot and bothered and rather silly. But I manage to cope, more or less, and they say how much they love my awful detective Sven Hirsten. If they knew how I hated him. But my publisher always says I'm not to say so. Anyway, I suppose the talk about detectives in real life grew out of all that, and I talked a bit about you, and this girl was standing around listening. When you said an unattractive Ophelia, it clicked somehow. I thought, now who does that remind me of? And then it came to me, of course, the girl at the party that day. I rather think she belonged there, unless I'm confusing her with some other girl. Poirot sighed. With Mrs. Oliver, one always needed a lot of patience. Who were these people with whom you went to have drinks? Uh, Trefusis, I think. Unless it was Treherne. Uh, that sort of name. He's a tycoon, rich, something in the city. But he's spent most of his life in South Africa. Has he a wife? Yes, very good-looking woman. Much younger than he is. Lots of golden hair. Second wife. The daughter was the first wife's daughter. Uh, then there was an uncle of incredible antiquity, rather deaf. He's frightfully distinguished. Strings of letters after his name. An admiral or an air marshal or something. He's an astronomer, too, I think. Anyway, he's got a kind of big telescope sticking out of the roof, though I suppose that might be just a hobby. There was a foreign girl there, too, who sort of trots about after the old boy, goes up to London with him, I believe, and sees he doesn't get run over. Rather pretty, she was. Poirot sorted out the information Mrs. Oliver had supplied him with, feeling rather like a human computer. There lives, then, in the house Mr. and Mrs. Trefusis. No, it's not Trefusis. Uh, oh, I remember now. It's Restaric. Uh, that is not at all the same type of name. Oh, yes, it is. It's a Cornish name, isn't it? There lives there, then, Mr. and Mrs. Restaric, the distinguished elderly uncle. Is his name Restaric, too? It's uh, Sir Roderick something. And there is the uh, au pair girl, or whatever she is, and the daughter. Any more children? I don't think so, but I really don't know. The daughter doesn't live at home, by the way. She was only down for the weekend. Doesn't get on with the stepmother, I expect. She's got a job in London, and she's picked up with a boyfriend they don't like much, so I understand. You seem to know quite a lot about the family. Oh, 
well, one picks things up. The Lorimers are great talkers, always chattering about someone or other. One hears a lot of gossip about the people all around. Sometimes, though, one gets them mixed up. I probably have. I wish I could remember that girl's Christian name. Something connected with the song. Thora, speak to me, Thora, 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 something like that. Or Myra. Myra, oh, Myra, my love is all for thee. Uh, something like that. I dreamt I dwelt in Marble Hall's Norma. Or do I mean Matatana? Norma? Norma Restaric, that's right, I'm sure. She added inconsequently, she's the third girl. I thought you said you thought she was an only child. Oh, so she is. Or I think so. Then uh, what do you mean by saying that she is the third girl? Good gracious, don't you know what a third girl is? Don't you read the Times? I read the births, deaths, and marriages, and such articles as I found of interest. No, I mean the front advertisement page. Only it isn't in the front now, so I'm thinking of taking some other paper, but I'll show you. She went to a side table and snatched up the Times, turned the pages over, and brought it to him. Here you are. Look. Third girl, for comfortable second-floor flat, own room, central heating, Earl's Court. Third girl wanted to share flat, five guineas, week, own room. Fourth girl wanted Regent's Park, own room. It's the way girls like living now, better than PG's or a hostel. The main girl takes a furnished flat, and then shares out the rent. Second girl is usually a friend, then they find a third girl by advertising if they don't know one. And as you see, very often they manage to squeeze in a fourth girl. First girl takes the best room, second girl pays rather less, third girl still less, and is stuck in a cat hole. They fix it among themselves, which one has the flat to herself, which night a week, or something like that. It works reasonably well. And where does this girl, whose name might just possibly be Norma, live in London? Well, as I've told you, I don't really know anything about her. But you could find out? Oh, yes. I expect that would be quite easy. You are sure there was no talk, no mention of an unexpected death? Do you mean a death in London, or at the Restaric's home? Either. I don't think so. Shall I see what I can rake up? Mrs. Oliver's eyes sparkled with excitement. She was by now entering into the spirit of the thing. That would be very kind. I'll ring up the Lorimers. Actually, now would be quite a good time. She went towards the telephone. I shall have to think of reasons and things, perhaps invent things. She looked towards Poirot rather doubtfully. But naturally, that is understood. You are a woman of imagination. You will have no difficulty. But uh, not too fantastic. You understand? Moderation. Mrs. Oliver flashed him an understanding glance. She dialed and asked for the number she wanted. Turning her head, she hissed, Have you got a pencil and paper, or a notebook, something to write down names and addresses, or places? Poirot had already his notebook arranged by his elbow, and nodded his head reassuringly. Mrs. Oliver turned back to the receiver she held, and launched herself into speech. Poirot listened attentively to one side of a telephone conversation. Hello! Can I speak to— Oh! <laughs> it's you, Naomi. Ariadne Oliver here. There he is. Well, it was rather a crowd. Oh, you mean the old boy? No, you know I don't. Practically blind. I thought he was going up to London with that little foreign girl. Yes, it must be rather worrying for them sometimes. But she seems to manage him quite well. One of the things I rang up for was to ask you what the girl's address was. No, the Restaric girl, I mean. Somewhere in South Ken, isn't it? Or was it Knightsbridge? Well, I promised her a book, and I wrote down the address, but of course I've lost it, as usual. <laughs> I can't even remember her name. Is it Thora or Norma? Yes, I thought it was Norma. Oh, wait a minute. I'll get a pencil. Yes, I'm ready. Sixty-seven Borodine Mansions. I know, that great block that looks rather like Wormwood Scrubs Prison. Yes, I believe the flats are very comfortable, with central heating and everything. Who are the other two girls she lives with? Friends of hers? Uh, or advertisements? Claudia Rees Holland? Oh, her father's the MP, is he? Who's the other one? No, I suppose you wouldn't know. Uh, she's quite nice, too, I suppose. What do they all do? Well, they always seem to be secretaries, don't they? No. Oh. The other girl's an interior decorator, you think? Or to do with an art gallery? No, Naomi, of course I don't really want to know. One just wonders what do all the girls do nowadays. Well, it's useful for me to know because of my books. One wants to keep up to date. What was it you told me about some boyfriend? Yes, but one's so helpless, isn't one? 
I mean girls do just exactly as they like. Does he look very awful? Is he the unshaven, dirty kind? Oh, that kind. Brocade waistcoats and long, curling chestnut hair lying on his shoulders. Yes. It's so hard to tell whether they're girls or boys, isn't it? Yes, they do look like Van Dyke sometimes, if they're good-looking. What did you say? Andrew Rysteric simply hates him. Yes, well, men usually do. Mary Rysteric? Well, I suppose you do usually have rows with a stepmother. I expect she was quite thankful when the girl got a job in London. What do you mean about people saying things? Why, couldn't they find out what was the matter with her? Who said? Yes, but what did they hush up? Oh, oh a nurse. Uh, talk to the Jenner's governess. Do you mean her husband? Oh, I see. The doctors couldn't find out. No, but people are so ill-natured. I do agree with you. Well, these things are usually quite untrue. Oh, gastric, was it? But how ridiculous. Do you mean people said... What's his name? Uh, Andrew. Well, you mean it would be easy with all those weed-killers about? Yes, but why? I mean, it's not a case of some wife he's hated for years. She's the second wife, and much younger than he is, and good-looking. Yes, I suppose that could be. But why should the foreign girl want to, either? Oh, you mean she might have resented things that Mrs. Restarek said to her? Oh, she's quite an attractive little thing. I suppose Andrew might have taken a fancy to her. Nothing serious, of course. It, it, it might have annoyed Mary, and then she might have pitched into the girl and— out of the corner of her eye, Mrs. Oliver perceived Poirot signalling wildly to her. "'Just a moment, darling,' said Mrs. Oliver into the telephone. "'It's the baker!' Poirot looked affronted. "'Hang on!' She laid down the receiver, hurried across the room, and backed Poirot into a breakfast nook. "'Yes?' she demanded breathlessly. "'A baker!' said Poirot with scorn. "'Me! Well, I had to think of something quickly. What were you signalling about? Did you understand what she—' Poirot cut her short. You shall tell me presently. I know enough. What I want you to do is, with your rapid powers of improvisation, to arrange some plausible pretext for me to visit the Restarics. An old friend of yours, shortly to be in the neighborhood, perhaps you could say, Leave it to me. I'll think of something. Shall you give a false name? Certainly not. Let us at least try to keep it simple. Mrs. Oliver nodded and hurried back to the abandoned telephone. Dear me! I can't remember what we were saying. Why does something always come to interrupt just when one has settled down to a nice gossip? I can't even remember now what I rang you up for to begin with. Oh, yes, that child Thora's address. Norma, I mean, and you gave it to me. But there was something else I wanted to— Oh, I remember. An old friend of mine, a most fascinating little man. Actually, I was talking about him the other day down there. Hercule Poirot, his name is. He's going to be staying quite close to the Rysterics, and he is most tremendously anxious to meet old Sir Roderick. He knows a lot about him, and has a terrific admiration for him, and for some wonderful discovery of his in the war, or some scientific thing he did. Anyway, he's very anxious to call upon him and present his respects. That's how he put it. Will that be all right, do you think? Will you warn them? Yes, he'll probably just turn up out of the blue. Tell them to make him tell them some wonderful espionage stories. He— what? Oh, your mowers. Oh, yes, of course, you must go. Goodbye. She put back the receiver and sank down in an armchair. Goodness, how exhausting. Was that all right? Not bad, said Poirot. I thought I'd better pin it all to the old boy. Then you'll get to see the lot, which I suppose is what you want, and one can always be vague about scientific subjects if one is a woman, and you can think up something more definite that sounds probable by the time you arrive. Now, do you want to hear what she was telling me? There has been gossip, I gather, about the health of Mrs. Restaric. That's it. It seems she had some kind of mysterious illness, gastric in nature, and the doctors were puzzled. They sent her into hospital, and she got quite all right, but there didn't seem any real cause to account for it. And she went home, and it all began to start again. And again the doctors were puzzled, and then people began to talk. A rather irresponsible nurse started it, and her sister told a neighbour, and the neighbour went out on daily work and told someone else, and how queer it all was. And then people began saying that her husband must be trying to poison her, the sort of thing people always say. But in this case, it really didn't seem to make sense. And then Naomi and I wondered about the au pair girl. She's a kind of secretary companion to the old boy, so really there isn't any kind of reason why she should administer weed-killer to Mrs. Rysteric. I heard you suggesting a few. Well, there is usually something possible. 
Murder desired, said Poirot thoughtfully, but not yet committed. Mrs. Oliver drove into the inner court of Borodine Mansions. There were six cars filling the parking space. As Mrs. Oliver hesitated, one of the cars reversed out and drove away. Mrs. Oliver hurried neatly into the vacant space. She descended, banged the door, and stood looking up to the sky. It was a recent block, occupying a space left by the havoc of a landmine in the last war. It might, Mrs. Oliver thought, have been lifted en bloc from the Great West Road, and, first deprived of some such legend as Skylark's feather razor blades, have been deposited as a block of flats in situ. It looked extremely functional, and whoever had built it had obviously scorned any ornamental additions. It was a busy time. Cars and people were going in and out of the courtyard as the day's work came to a close. Mrs. Oliver glanced down at her wrist. Ten minutes to seven. About the right time, as far as she could judge. The kind of time when girls in jobs might be presumed to have returned, either to renew their makeup, change their clothes to tight, exotic pants, or whatever their particular addiction was, and go out again. Or else to settle down to home life, and wash their smalls and their stockings. Anyway, quite a sensible time to try. Le Bloc was exactly the same on the east and the west, with big swing doors set in the centre. Mrs. Oliver chose the left-hand side, but immediately found that she was wrong. All this side was numbers from one hundred to two hundred. She crossed over to the other side. Number sixty-seven was on the sixth floor. Mrs. Oliver pressed the button of the lift. The doors opened like a yawning mouth with a menacing clash. Mrs. Oliver hurried into the yawning cavern. She was always afraid of modern lifts. Crash! The doors came to again. The lift went up. It stopped almost immediately. That was frightening, too. Mrs. Oliver scuttled out like a frightened rabbit. She looked up at the wall and went along the right-hand passage. She came to a door marked 67 in metal numbers affixed to the centre of the door. The numeral 7 detached itself and fell on her feet as she arrived. This place doesn't like me, said Mrs. Oliver to herself, as she winced with pain and picked the number up gingerly and affixed it by its spike to the door again. She pressed the bell. Perhaps everyone was out. However, the door opened almost at once. A tall, handsome girl stood in the doorway. She was wearing a dark, well-cut suit, with a very short skirt, a white silk shirt, and was very well shod. She had swept up dark hair, good but discreet makeup, and for some reason was slightly alarming to Mrs. Oliver. Oh, said Mrs. Oliver, galvanizing herself to say the right thing, is Miss Risteric in by any chance? No, I'm sorry, she's out. Can I give her a message? Mrs. Oliver said, Oh, again, before proceeding. She made a play of action by producing a parcel rather untidily done up in brown paper. I promised her a book, she explained. One of mine that she hadn't read. I hope I've remembered, actually, which it was. She won't be in soon, I suppose? I really couldn't say. I don't know what she's doing tonight. Oh, are you Miss Rhys Holland? The girl looked slightly surprised. Yes, I am. I've met your father, said Mrs. Oliver. She went on. I'm Mrs. Oliver. I write books, she added, in the usual guilty style in which she invariably made such an announcement. Oh, won't you come in? Mrs. Oliver accepted the invitation, and Claudia Rhys Holland led her into a sitting room. All the rooms of the flats were papered the same with an artificial raw wood pattern. Tenants could then display their modern pictures, or apply any forms of decoration they fancied. There was a foundation of modern built-in furniture, cupboard, bookshelves and so on, a large settee, and a pull-out type of table. Personal bits and pieces could be added by the tenants. There were also signs of individuality displayed here by a gigantic harlequin pasted on one wall, and a stencil of a monkey swinging from branches of palm fronds on another wall. "'I'm sure Norma will be thrilled to get your book, Mrs. Oliver. Oh, won't you have a drink? Sherry? Gin?' This girl had the brisk manner of a really good secretary. Mrs. Oliver refused. "'You've uh, got a splendid view up here,' she said, looking out of the window, and blinking a little as she got the setting sun straight in her eyes. "'Yes. Not so funny when the lift goes out of order. I shouldn't have thought that lift would dare to go out of order. It's so... <laughs> so robot-like.' "'Recently installed, but none the better for that,' said Claudia. 
It needs frequent adjusting and all that. Another girl came in, talking as she entered. Claudia, have you any idea where I put— She stopped, looking at Mrs. Oliver. Claudia made a quick introduction. Francis Carey, Mrs. Oliver, Mrs. Ariadne Oliver. Oh, how exciting, said Francis. She was a tall, willowy girl with long black hair, a heavily made-up dead white face, and eyebrows and eyelashes slightly slanted upwards, the effect heightened by mascara. She wore tight velvet pants and a heavy sweater. She was a complete contrast to the brisk and efficient Claudia. "'I brought a book I'd promised Norma Risteric,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'Oh, what a pity she's still in the country. Hasn't she come back?' There was quite definitely a pause. Mrs. Oliver thought the two girls exchanged a glance. "'I thought she had a job in London,' said Mrs. Oliver, endeavouring to convey innocent surprise. "'Oh, yes,' said Claudia. "'She's in an interior decorating place. She's sent down with patterns occasionally to places in the country.' She smiled. "'We live rather separate lives here,' she explained. "'Come and go as we like. I don't usually bother to leave messages. But I won't forget to give her your book when she does get back.' Nothing could have been easier than the casual explanation. Mrs. Oliver rose. "'Well, thank you very much.' Claudia accompanied her to the door. "'I shall tell my father I've met you,' she said. "'He's a great reader of detective stories.' Closing the door, she went back into the sitting-room. The girl Frances was leaning against the window. "'Sorry,' she said. "'Did I boob?' "'I just said that Norma was out.' Frances shrugged her shoulders. "'Well, I couldn't tell.' "'Claudia, where is that girl? Why didn't she come back on Monday? Where has she gone? I can't imagine. Or she didn't stay on down with her people. That's where she went for the weekend. No, I rang up, actually, to find out. Oh, I suppose it doesn't really matter. All the same, she is... Well, there's something queer about her. She's not really queerer than anyone else. But the opinion sounded uncertain. Oh, yes, she is.' said Francis. Sometimes she gives me the shivers. She's not normal, you know. She laughed suddenly. <laughs> Norma isn't normal. You know she isn't, Claudia, though you won't admit it. Loyalty to your employer, I suppose. Hercule Poirot walked along the main street of Long Basing. That is, if you can describe as a main street, a street that is to all intents and purposes the only street, which was the case in Long Basing. It was one of those villages that exhibit a tendency to length without breadth. It had an impressive church with a tall tower and a yew-tree of elderly dignity in its churchyard. It had its full quota of village shops, disclosing much variety. It had two antique shops, one mostly consisting of stripped pine chimney-pieces, the other disclosing a full house of piled-up ancient maps, a good deal of porcelain, most of it chipped, some worm-eaten old oak chests, Shelves of glass, some Victorian silver, all somewhat hampered in display by lack of space. There were two cafes, both rather nasty. There was a basket shop, quite delightful, with a large variety of homemade wares. There was a post office come greengrocer. There was a draper's, which dealt largely in millinery, and also a shoe department for children, and a large miscellaneous selection of haberdashery of all kinds. There was a stationery and newspaper shop, which also dealt in tobacco and sweets. There was a wool shop, which was clearly the aristocrat of the place. Two white-haired, severe women were in charge of shelves and shelves of knitting materials of every description, also large quantities of dressmaking patterns and knitting patterns, and which branched off into a counter for art needlework. What had lately been the local grocer's had now blossomed into calling itself a supermarket, complete with stacks of wire baskets and packaged materials of every cereal and cleaning material— all in dazzling paper boxes, and there was a small establishment with one small window, with Lila written across it in fancy letters, a fashion display of one French blouse labelled Latest Chic, and a navy skirt and a purple striped jumper labelled Separates. These were displayed by being flung down as by a careless hand in the window. All of this Poirot observed with a detached interest. Also contained within the limits of the village and facing on the street were several small houses, old-fashioned in style, sometimes retaining Georgian purity, more often showing some signs of Victorian improvement, as a veranda, bow window, or a small conservatory. 
One or two houses had had a complete facelift, and showed signs of claiming to be new and proud of it. There were also some delightful and decrepit old-world cottages, some pretending to be a hundred or so years older than they were, others completely genuine, any added comforts of plumbing or such being carefully hidden from any casual glance. Poirot walked gently along, digesting all that he saw. If his impatient friend Mrs. Oliver had been with him, she would have immediately demanded why he was wasting time, as the house to which he was bound was a quarter of a mile beyond the village limits. Poirot would have told her that he was absorbing the local atmosphere, that these things were sometimes important. At the end of the village there came an abrupt transition. On one side, set back from the road, was a row of newly built council houses, a strip of green in front of them, and a gay note set by each house having been given a different coloured front door. Beyond the council houses the sway of fields and hedges resumed its course, interspersed now and then by the occasional desirable residences of a house agent's list, with their own trees and gardens, and a general air of reserve, and of keeping themselves to themselves. Ahead of him, further down the road, Poirot descried a house, the top story of which displayed an unusual note of bulbous construction. Something had evidently been tacked on up there not so many years ago. This, no doubt, was the Mecca towards which his feet were bent. He arrived at a gate to which the nameplate Cross Hedges was attached. He surveyed the house. It was a conventional house, dating perhaps to the beginning of the century. It was neither beautiful nor ugly. Commonplace was perhaps the word to describe it. The garden was more attractive than the house, and had obviously been the subject of a great deal of care and attention in its time, though it had been allowed to fall into disarray. It still had smooth green lawns, plenty of flower-beds, carefully planted areas of shrubs to display a certain landscape effect. It was all in good order. A gardener was certainly employed in this garden, Poirot reflected. A personal interest was perhaps also taken, since he noted in a corner near the house a woman bending over one of the flower-beds, tying up dahlias, he thought. Her head showed as a bright circle of pure gold colour. She was tall, slim, but square-shouldered. He unlatched the gate, passed through, and walked up towards the house. The woman turned her head, and then straightened herself, turning towards him inquiringly. She remained standing, waiting for him to speak, some garden twine hanging from her left hand. She looked, he noted, puzzled. "'Yes?' she said. Poirot, very foreign, took off his hat with a flourish and bowed. Her eyes rested on his moustaches with a kind of fascination. "'Mrs. Restaric?' "'Yes, I—I I hope I do not derange you, madame.' A faint smile touched her lips. "'Not at all. Are you—' "'I have permitted myself to pay a visit on you. A friend of mine, Mrs. Ariadne Oliver—' "'Oh, of course. I know who you must be. Monsieur Poiret.' "'Monsieur Poirot,' he corrected her with an emphasis on the last syllable. "'Hercule Poirot, at your service.' I was passing through this neighbourhood, and I ventured to call upon you here in the hope that I might be allowed to pay my respects to Sir Roderick Horsfield. Yes, Naomi Lorimer told us you might turn up. I hope it is not inconvenient. Oh, it's not inconvenient at all. Ariadne Oliver was here last weekend. She came over with the Lorimers. Her books are most amusing, aren't they? But perhaps you don't find detective stories amusing. You are a detective yourself, aren't you? A real one. "'I am all that there is of the most real,' said Hercule Poirot. He noticed that she repressed a smile. He studied her more closely. She was handsome, in a rather artificial fashion. Her golden hair was stiffly arranged. He wondered whether she might not at heart be secretly unsure of herself, whether she were not carefully playing the part of the English lady absorbed in her garden. He wondered a little what her social background might have been. "'You have a very fine garden here,' he said. "'You like gardens?' "'Not as the English like gardens. "'You have, for a garden, a special talent in England. "'It means something to you that it does not to us.' "'To French people, you mean?' "'Oh, yes. "'I believe that Mrs. Oliver mentioned that you were once with the Belgian police force. "'That is so. "'Me, I am an old Belgian police dog.' "'He gave a polite little laugh and said, waving his hands, but your gardens, you English, I admire. I sit at your feet. The Latin races, they like the formal garden, the gardens of the chateau. 
the Chateau of Versailles in miniature, and, of course, they invented the potager. Very important, the potager. Here in England you have the potager, but you got it from France, and you do not love your potager as much as you love your flowers, huh? That is so? Yes, I, I think you are right, said Mary Rastaric. Do come into the house. You came to see my uncle. I came, as you say, to pay homage to Sir Roderick. But I pay homage to you also, madame. Always I pay homage to beauty when I meet it. He bowed. She laughed with slight embarrassment. <laughs> you mustn't pay me so many compliments. She led the way through an open French window, and he followed her. I knew your uncle slightly in 1944. Poor dear, he's getting quite an old man now. He's very deaf, I'm afraid. It was long ago that I encountered him. He will probably have forgotten. It was a matter of espionage and of scientific developments of a certain invention. We owed that invention to the ingenuity of Sir Roderick. He will be willing, I hope, to receive me. Oh, I'm sure he'll love it, said Mrs. Rastaric. He has rather a dull life in some ways nowadays. I have to be so much in London. We're looking for a suitable house there. She sighed and said, Elderly people can be very difficult sometimes. I know, said Poirot. Frequently I, too, am difficult. She laughed. Ah, oh, no, Monsieur Poirot, come now. You mustn't pretend you're old. Sometimes I am taught so, said Poirot, he sighed. By young girls, he added mournfully. Well, that's very unkind of them. It's probably the sort of thing that our daughter would do, she added. Ah, you have a daughter? Yes, at least she is my stepdaughter. I shall have much pleasure in meeting her, said Poirot politely. Oh, well, I'm afraid she's not here. She lives in London. She works there. The young girls, they all do jobs nowadays? Everybody is supposed to do a job, said Mrs. Rastaric vaguely. Even when they get married, they're always being persuaded back into industry or back into teaching. Have they persuaded you, madame, to come back into anything? No, I was brought up in South Africa. I only came here with my husband a short time ago. It's all rather strange to me still. She looked round her with what Poirot judged to be an absence of enthusiasm. It was a handsomely furnished room of a conventional type. Without personality, two large portraits hung on the walls, the only personal touch. The first was that of a thin-lipped woman in a grey velvet evening dress. Facing her, on the opposite wall, was a man of about thirty-odd, with an air of repressed energy about him. "'Your daughter, I suppose, finds it dull in the country.' "'Yes, it is much better for her to be in London. She doesn't like it here.' She paused abruptly, and then, as though the last words were almost dragged out of her, she said, "'And she doesn't like me.' "'Impossible,' said Hercule Poirot, with Gallic politeness. And "'Not at all impossible. Oh, well, I, I suppose it often happens. I suppose it's hard for girls to accept a stepmother.' Was your daughter very fond of her own mother? I suppose she must have been. She's a difficult girl. I suppose most girls are. Poirot sighed and said, Mothers and fathers have much less control over daughters nowadays. It is not as it used to be in the old good-fashioned days. <laughs> no, indeed. One dare not say so, madame, but I must confess I regret that they show so very little discrimination in choosing their... <laughs> How do you say it, uh, their boyfriends? Norma has been a great worry to her father in that way. However, I suppose it's no good complaining. People must make their own experiments. But I must take you up to Uncle Roddy. He has his own rooms upstairs. She led the way out of the room. Poirot looked back over his shoulder. A dull room. A room without character. Except, perhaps, for the two portraits. By the style of the woman's dress... Poirot judged that they dated from some years back. If that was the first Mrs. Restaric, Poirot did not think that he would have liked her. He said, "'Those are fine portraits, madame.' "'Yes, Landsberger did them.' It was the name of a famous and exceedingly expensive fashionable portrait painter of twenty years ago. His meticulous naturalism had now gone out of fashion, and since his death he was little spoken of. His sitters were sometimes sneeringly spoken of as clothes props, but Poirot thought they were a good deal more than that. He suspected that there was a carefully concealed mockery behind the smooth exteriors that Landsberger executed so effortlessly. Mary Rastaric said as she went up the stairs ahead of him, "'They have just come out of storage, 
had been cleaned up, and she stopped abruptly, coming to a dead halt, one hand on the stair rail. Above her, a figure had just turned the corner of the staircase on its way down. It was a figure that seemed strangely incongruous. It might have been someone in fancy dress, someone who certainly did not match with this house. He was a figure familiar enough to Poirot in different conditions, a figure often met in the streets of London or even at parties, a representative of the youth of today. He wore a black coat, an elaborate velvet waistcoat, skin-tight pants, and rich curls of chestnut hair hung down on his neck. He looked exotic and rather beautiful, and it needed a few moments to be certain of his sex. David! Mary Rysteric spoke sharply. What on earth are you doing here? The young man was by no means taken aback. Startled you? he asked. So sorry. What are you doing here? In this house? You... you've come down here with Norma? Norma? Uh, no, I hope to find her here. Find her here? What do you mean? She's in London. Oh, but my dear, she isn't. At any rate, she's not at sixty-seven Borodine Mansions. What do you mean she isn't there? Well, since she didn't come back this weekend, I thought she was probably here with you. I came down to see what she was up to. She left here Sunday night, as usual. She added, in an angry voice, Why didn't you ring the bell and let us know you were here? What are you doing roaming about the house? Really, darling, you seem to be thinking I'm going to pinch the spoons or something. Surely it's natural to walk into a house in broad daylight. Why ever not? Well, we're old-fashioned, and we don't like it. Oh, dear, dear, David sighed. The fuss everyone makes. Well, my dear, if I'm not going to have a welcome, and you don't seem to know where your stepdaughter is, I suppose I'd better be moving along. Shall I turn out my pockets before I go? Don't be absurd, David. Ta-da, then. The young man passed them, waved an airy hand, and went on down and out through the open front door. Horrible creature, said Mary Restaric, with a sharpness of rancour that startled Poirot. I can't bear him. I simply can't stand him. Why is England absolutely full of these people nowadays? Ah, madame, do not disquiet yourself. It is all a question of fashion. There have always been fashions. You see less in the country, but in London you meet plenty of them. Dreadful, said Mary, absolutely dreadful, effeminate, exotic, and yet not unlike a Van Dyke portrait. Do you not think so, madame? In a gold frame, wearing a lace collar, you would not then say he was effeminate or exotic. Daring to come down here like that, Andrew would have been furious. It worries him dreadfully. Daughters can be very worrying. It's not even as though Andrew knew Norma well. He's been abroad since she was a child. He left her entirely to her mother to bring up, and now he finds her a complete puzzle. So do I, for that matter. I can't help feeling that she is a very odd type of girl. One has no kind of authority over them these days. They seem to like the worst type of young men. She's absolutely infatuated with this David Baker. One can't do anything. Andrew forbade him the house, and look, he turns up here, walks in as cool as a cucumber. I think... I almost think I'd better not tell Andrew. I don't want him to be unduly worried. I believe she goes about with this creature in London. And not only with him. There are some much worse ones, even. The kind that don't wash, completely unshaven faces and funny, sprouting beards and greasy clothes. Poirot said cheerfully, Alas, madame, you must not distress yourself. The indiscretions of youth pass. Well, I hope so, I'm sure. Norma is a very difficult girl. Sometimes I think she's not right in the head. She's so peculiar. She really looks sometimes as though she isn't all there. These extraordinary dislikes she takes. Dislikes? She hates me. Really hates me. I don't see why it's necessary. I suppose she was very devoted to her mother, but after all it's only reasonable that her father should marry again, isn't it? Do you think she really hates you? Oh, I know she does. I've had ample proof of it. I can't say how relieved I was when she went off to London. I didn't want to make trouble. She stopped suddenly. It was as though for the first time she realized that she was talking to a stranger. Poirot had the capacity to attract confidences. It was as though when people were talking to him, they hardly realized who it was they were talking to. She gave a short laugh now. <laughs> Dear me, she said, I don't really know why I'm saying all this to you. I expect every family has these problems. 
Poor stepmothers. We have a hard time of it. Ah, here we are. She tapped on a door. Come in! Come in! It was a stentorian roar. Here is a visitor to see you, uncle, said Mary Rastarek as she walked into the room, Poirot behind her. A broad-shouldered, square-faced, red-cheeked, irascible-looking elderly man had been pacing the floor. He stumped forward towards them. At the table behind him, a girl was sitting sorting letters and papers. Her head was bent over them, a sleek, dark head. "'This is Monsieur Hercule Poirot, Uncle Roddy,' said Mary Rastarek. Poirot stepped forward gracefully into action and speech. "'Ah, Sir Roderick, it is many years, many years since I have had the pleasure of meeting you. We have to go back so far as the last war. It was, I think, in Normandy the last time. How well I remember. There was also Colonel Race, and there was General Abercrombie, and there was Air Marshal Sir Edmund Collingsby. What decisions we had to take, and what difficulties we had with security. <laughs> ah, nowadays there is no longer the need for secrecy. I recall the unmasking of that secret agent who succeeded for so long. You remember Captain Henderson? Ah, uh, Captain Henderson, indeed. Lord, that damned swine. Unmasked. You may not remember me. Hercule Poirot. Yes, yes, of course I remember you. Ah, it was a close shave, that, a close shave. You were the French representative, weren't you? There were one or two of them. One I couldn't get on with. Can't remember his name. Oh, well, sit down, sit down. Nothing like having a chat over old days. I feared so much that you might not remember me or my colleague, Monsieur Giraud. Yes, yes, of course, I remember both of you. Ah, <laughs> those were the days. Those were the days indeed. The girl at the table got up. She moved a chair politely towards Poirot. That's right, Sonia, that's right, said Sir Roderick. Let me introduce you, he said, to my charming little secretary here. Makes a great difference to me. Helps me, you know. Files all my work. Don't know how I ever got on without her. Poirot bowed politely. Enchanté, mademoiselle he murmured. The girl murmured something in rejoinder. She was a small creature with black bobbed hair. She looked shy. Her dark blue eyes were usually modestly cast down, but she smiled up sweetly and shyly at her employer. He patted her on the shoulder. "'Don't know what I should do without her,' he said. "'I don't really.' "'Oh, no,' the girl protested. "'I am not much good, really. I cannot type very fast.' "'You type quite fast enough, my dear.' You're my memory, too, my eyes and my ears and a great many other things. She smiled again at him. One remembers, murmured Poirot, some of the excellent stories that used to go the round. I don't know if they were exaggerated or not. Now, for instance, the day that someone stole your car, and— He proceeded to follow up the tale. Sir Roderick was delighted. <laughs> of course now, yes, indeed, well, a bit of an exaggeration, I expect. But on the whole, that's how it was, yes, yes. Well, fancy your remembering that, after all this long time. But I could tell you a better one than that now. He launched forth into another tale. Poirot listened, applauded. Finally, he glanced at his watch and rose to his feet. But I must detain you no longer, he said. You are engaged, I can see, in important work. It was just that being in this neighborhood, I could not help paying my respects. Years pass, but you, I see, have lost none of your vigor, of your enjoyment of life. Well, well, perhaps you may say so. Anyway, you mustn't pay me too many compliments. But surely, you'll stay and have tea. I'm sure Mary will give you some tea. He looked round. Oh, oh she's gone away. A nice girl. Yes, indeed, and very handsome. I expect she has been a great comfort to you for many years. Oh, they've only married recently. She's my nephew's second wife. I'll be frank with you. I've never cared very much for this nephew of mine. Andrew, not a steady chap. Always restless. His elder brother Simon was my favourite. Not that I knew him well, either. As for Andrew, he behaved very badly to his first wife. Went off, you know. Left her high and dry. Went off with a thoroughly bad lot. Everybody knew about her, but he was infatuated with her. The whole thing broke up in a year or two. Silly fellow. The girl he's married seems all right. Nothing wrong with her, as far as I know. Now, Simon was a steady chap. Damn dull, though. I can't say I liked it when my sister married into that family. Marrying into trade, you know. Rich, of course, but money isn't everything. We've usually married into the services. I never saw much of the Rusteric lot. They have, I believe, a daughter. A friend of mine met her last week. 
Oh, Norma. <laughs> Silly girl. Goes about in dreadful clothes and has picked up with a dreadful young man. Ah, well. They're all alike nowadays. Long-haired young fellows, beatniks, beetles, all sorts of names they've got. I can't keep up with them. Practically talk a foreign language. Still, nobody cares to hear an old man's criticism, so there we are. Even Mary. I always thought she was a good, sensible sort. But as far as I can see, she can be thoroughly hysterical in some ways, mainly about her health. Some fuss about going into hospital for observation or something. What about a drink? Whiskey? No. Sure you won't stop and have a drop of tea? Uh, thank you, but I am staying with friends. Well, I must say I've enjoyed this chat with you very much. Nice to remember some of the things that happened in the old days. Uh, Sonia, dear, perhaps you'll take Monsieur... Uh, sorry, what's your name? It's gone again. Ah, yes, Poirot. Uh, take him down to Mary, will you? No, no. Hercule Poirot hastily waved aside the offer. I could not dream of troubling Madame any more. I am quite all right, quite all right. I can find my way perfectly. It has been a great pleasure to meet you again. He left the room. Haven't the faintest idea who that chap was, said Sir Roderick, after Poirot had gone. You do not know who he was? Sonia asked, looking at him in a startled manner. Personally, I don't remember who half the people are who come up and talk to me nowadays. Of course, I have to make a good shot at it. One learns to get away with that, you know. Same thing at parties. Up comes a chap and says, Perhaps you don't remember me. I last saw you in 1939. Well, I have to say, of course I remember, but I don't. It's a handicap being nearly blind and deaf. We got pally with a lot of frogs like that towards the end of the war. Don't remember half of them. Oh, he'd been there all right. He knew me. And I knew a good many of the chaps he talked about. That story about me and the stolen car, that was true enough. Exaggerated a bit, of course. But they made a pretty good story of it at the time. Ah, well. I don't think he knew I didn't remember him. Clever chap, I should say. But a thorough frog, isn't he? You know, mincing and dancing and bowing and scraping. Now then, where were we? Sonia picked up a letter and handed it to him. She tentatively proffered a pair of spectacles, which he immediately rejected. "'Don't want those damn things! I can see all right!' He screwed up his eyes and peered down at the letter he was holding. Then he capitulated and thrust it back into her hands. "'Well, uh, perhaps you'd better read it to me.' She started reading it in her clear, soft voice. End of Disc One 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 End of Disc One